Imagine setting sail into endless blue, guided only by the stars, the waves, and memory. Yet these voyagers did what no empire or modern fleet had achieved. Uh, how his ancestors were able to navigate so well by the star. How did Polynesian peoples, separated by thousands of miles of open ocean, come to settle some of the most isolated islands on Earth, from Hawaii to Easter Island to Aotearoa, New Zealand? Early explorers called them drifters, even castaways. Before we set sail on this journey, make sure you subscribe to Stone and Bone, where we uncover the real science behind history's greatest mysteries and reveal how genetics and archaeology keep rewriting our past. 6,000 years ago, long before Polynesian canoes sliced through the Pacific, an island north of the equator was changing forever. That island was Taiwan, home to the Doppenking culture, a Neolithic world of rice farmers, dog breeders, and early potters living along fertile coasts. But around 6,000 to 5,000 years ago, the Holocene climate optimum began to raise global sea levels. The ocean devoured farmland, rivers shifted, and entire villages vanished beneath rising tides. Most ancient societies might have retreated inland. These people did the opposite. They built boats. Timber from breadfruit and camphor trees became holes. They studied tides and monsoon winds, learning that the sea could be a road rather than a barrier. With them, they carried everything they knew. Seeds of rice and millet, pigs and dogs for companionship and food, and obsidian blades for carving and trade. This was the dawn of the Austronesian expansion, one of humanity's greatest migrations, stretching ultimately from Madagascar in the west to Easter Island in the east. But before they ever reached the vast Pacific, they made a critical first leap, a tiny chain of stepping stones called the Bataan's Islands, lying between Taiwan and the Philippines. Archaeologists at Sungit site on Itbayat Island have unearthed pottery that mixes both Taiwanese and Philippine styles, dated to roughly 4,800 years ago. Pig bones and obsidian tools found there match chemical signatures from southern Taiwan, proving this was no random drift. It was a deliberate waypoint. Batanes became the launch pad for a people who would learn to live entirely at sea. Here, they refined boat building, perfected open ocean farming, and began merging with local islanders, the first genetic threads in a tapestry that would span the Pacific. By mastering these waters, they took humanity's first real step into the blue unknown, a step that would, millennia later, create the Polynesian world. By around 3,300 years ago, the descendants of those Taiwanese voyagers reached the chain of islands north of Papua New Guinea, known as the Bismarck Archipelago. Here, on volcanic shores littered with coral and obsidian, something remarkable emerged, a civilization built from ocean. Archaeologists call it the Lapita culture. Their red clay pottery, decorated with precise dentate stamped triangles and geometric patterns, appears across 4,000 kilometers of ocean, from New Britain to Tonga. Each design was a fingerprint, a breadcrumb of migration. But Lapita wasn't defined by art alone. It was a blueprint for colonization, the first system that made long-distance oceanic living possible. Excavations at Talapakimalai, Musau Island, and Nukuleka, Tonga, show standardized house foundations, shell ornaments, and obsidian from New Britain, evidence of a connected trade world. When scientists sequenced ancient DNA from Lapita burials in Vanuatu and Tonga, Skogland at Eyal, Nature 2016, they found something unexpected. Those first Lapita people were nearly 100% East Asian in ancestry, not Melanesian. That means they had moved fast, skipping major intermixing, carrying their entire way of life across open ocean. And that way of life was astonishingly complete. Lapita voyagers transported pigs, dogs, chickens, yam cuttings, taro plants, and even soil microbes packed in coconut husks to fertilize new gardens. Archaeologists call this idea transported landscapes. Portable ecosystems ready to restart civilization anywhere they landed. Their pottery wasn't decorative clutter. Measurements show uniform wall thickness 
and volume ratios. Proof of standardization for food and water storage. Each vessel was a calibrated tool for survival. Imagine sailing for weeks, guided only by stars, with everything your community needs growing or breathing on board. This wasn't accidental discovery. It was ecological engineering. If you were about to sail into the unknown, leaving your home forever, what one thing would you carry to build a new world? Tell us in the comments. We'll feature the most creative answers in our next Stone and Bone episode. For decades, textbooks claimed Polynesians were roughly 80% Southeast Asian and 20% Melanesian, a simple mixture. But modern genome-wide sequencing has torn that simplicity apart. Studies by Lipson et al., PNAS 2018, and Wolstein et al., Nature Genetics 2023, reveal a layered, multi-wave ancestry that unfolded over millennia. Phase 1, around 3,000 years before present the Lapita Pioneers, with nearly 100% East Asian DNA. Phase 2, about 2,000 to 1,200 years before present. This is when Melanesian admixture appears, roughly 25 to 35%. Phase 3, between 1,000 and 700 years before present, the final Polynesian expansion. When the genetic profile stabilizes as they reach Samoa and Tonga, these numbers tell a story of encounter and exchange, as they voyaged through the Solomons and Fiji, Lapita descendants intermarried with Melanesian communities. Yet the pattern wasn't balanced, it was sex biased. Most Polynesian mitochondrial DNA, inherited from mothers, comes from the Asian lineage B4A1A1, the so-called Polynesian motif. But most Y chromosomes, passed from fathers, belong to C2A1 of Melanesian origin. In short, Asian women, Melanesian men. Why? Possibly through inter-island alliances, marriage exchanges, or the social realities of exploration. Men joining voyaging crews, women anchoring cultural continuity. These mixtures created a new genetic identity, neither Asian nor Melanesian, but Oceanian. A lineage adapted to isolation and endurance. Modern Polynesians still carry signatures of that adaptation. They possess extra copies of the AMI1 gene, improving starch digestion, critical for a diet based on taro and breadfruit, and a variant called CREBRF, P.ARG457 GLEN, acts as a so-called thrifty gene. It helped boost fat storage for survival on long ocean voyages, but today it contributes to a higher risk of obesity. Even within the genome, their story is one of navigation, adjusting, adapting, surviving. What made this migration possible wasn't luck. It was engineering that rivaled the precision of modern naval design. Polynesian double-hulled voyaging canoes were masterpieces of hydrodynamics. Where trees were massive, builders carved hulls from single trunks. On smaller islands, they stitched planks with coconut fiber and waterproofed seams with breadfruit sap. Each vessel could reach over 15 meters in length, carrying families, livestock, and plants across thousands of miles. The crab claw sail, an inverted triangular shape unique to the Pacific, was their secret advantage. It harnessed wind from multiple directions and allowed tacking, sailing against the wind, something even many early European ships couldn't do. Modern reconstructions like the Hakulea have clocked speeds of 12 knots. 22 kilometers per hour, rivaling small modern sailboats. A 2023 study in ocean engineering confirmed that Polynesian double hulls outperformed outrigger designs in upwind stability and energy efficiency, proving two-way voyages across the Pacific were entirely feasible. But the technology was only half the story. The other half lived in the mind. Polynesian navigators, or wayfinders, memorized hundreds of stars, each rising and setting at predictable angles. They read ocean swells, felt subtle wave refractions against their hulls, and tracked bird migration routes to detect land beyond the horizon. Cloud colors, seaweed types, and even the smell of air told them distance and direction. And this wasn't random intuition. It was trained science passed orally. Apprentices learned through chants and gestures, each rhythm encoding entire star maps. 
A Micronesian navigation song describes 21 islands and sailing directions, later verified by GPS as 85% accurate. Imagine memorizing the ocean itself, every current, every star, every swell, then teaching it in poetry. That is how the Pacific was mapped long before a single compass was forged. For generations, one mystery lingered over the Pacific. How did the sweet potato, a crop native to South America, end up thriving in Polynesian gardens centuries before European ships ever crossed the ocean? Botany alone couldn't explain it. Sweet potato tubers rot quickly in seawater. They couldn't simply drift. Linguistics offered the first clue. The Polynesian word kumara mirrors kumar, or kumal, in the Quechua and Imara languages of the Andes. But the real breakthrough came in 2020, when Iowan Titus et al. Nature analyzed genomes from Polynesians and indigenous Colombians of the Xenu region. They discovered shared genetic segments dating to around 1150 to 1230 AD. That means Polynesians didn't just receive a crop. They met people. Somewhere in the Eastern Pacific, perhaps the Marquesas, Mangareva, or Rapa Nui, voyagers from the West made landfall, exchanged goods, genes, and stories, and then sailed home. The contact was small but real, about 5% Native American ancestry in some island populations. Yet that tiny trace changed everything. The sweet potato became the backbone of Maori agriculture in New Zealand and a staple across eastern Polynesia. Polynesians weren't passive recipients of nature's drift. They were explorers capable of a round-trip voyage across the world's largest ocean, an achievement unmatched until the age of global navigation. Do you think ancient Polynesians might have reached the Americas centuries before Columbus? Drop your thoughts below. We'll feature the sharpest theories and your names in an upcoming Stone and Bone deep dive. Then, suddenly, the sails fell quiet. After nearly 2,000 years of expansion, no new islands were settled after about 1300 AD. Why? The answer lies in the sky and in the climate. Around this time, Earth entered a cooling phase known as the Little Ice Age. Pacific trade winds shifted, sea temperatures dropped, tropical crops like breadfruit and taro began to fail in the farthest archipelagos. Archaeological strata from Tonga, Rapa Nui, and Hawaii show the fingerprints of stress. Fewer fish bones, fortified hilltop villages, and layers of ash and charcoal from intensified warfare and ritual burning. Communities grew insular, guarding what little they had. Oral traditions echo the trauma. In Hawaii, chants speak of the ocean turning away. On Rapa Nui, elders were called the sky closing. To their descendants, those were poetic warnings. But science now links them to El Nino oscillations and prolonged droughts documented in coral isotope cores. McGregor et al. The Holocene, 2010. The Polynesians didn't vanish. They adapted. They shifted from open ocean exploration to island sustainability, consolidating kingdoms, codifying religion, and preserving knowledge rather than risking extinction at sea. The Age of Voyages became an age of guardianship. Exploration turned inward, into memory, genealogy, and myth. Even when the canoes stopped sailing, the knowledge never died. It simply changed form. Across 10,000 islands, languages from Hawaiian to Maori to Tahitian all belong to the oceanic branch of the Austronesian family. A linguistic web so consistent that entire sentence structures still mirror each other after two millennia apart. That unity is proof of a recent, rapid expansion. But these weren't just languages, they were living atlases. Navigators memorize star routes, island chains, and wind corridors through rhythm and poetry. A single Micronesian chant encodes 21 islands in their directions, verified by modern GPS as more than 85% accurate. Every rhyme, every beat, was a line of longitude sung aloud. Where other civilizations carved their chronicles in stone, Polynesians wrote theirs in syllables in salt water. Their books were the minds of navigators, their libraries, the hulls of canoes. And when European explorers finally arrived, 
they found a world already mapped, not on parchment, but in the memory of people who had once measured the Pacific with their hearts and their hands. Centuries after the last great voyages, the stars above the Pacific still remembered. In 1976, a canoe named Hokulea rose again from those memories, built in Hawaii, guided without compass or maps, and crewed by voyagers determined to prove their ancestors' genius. Their mentor was Mao Piailuk, a master navigator from Micronesia, one of the last to hold the complete oral knowledge of wayfinding. Under his direction, Hokulea sailed from Hawaii to Tahiti, crossing more than 4,800 kilometers using only traditional techniques, reading stars, swells, birds, and the color of clouds. When the canoe reached Tahiti's shores, tens of thousands lined the beaches weeping. The old knowledge had lived. That voyage sparked a cultural awakening across the Pacific. Navigation schools reopened in Samoa, Tonga, and the Cook Islands. Elders began recording chants once whispered in secrecy. Polynesian identity, long pressed under colonial myths, re-emerged as a scientific and spiritual inheritance. And in laboratories half a world away, geneticists were finding the same truth written in blood. Ancient DNA confirmed the vast sweep of Austronesian ancestry, while modern projects, like those led by Terunanga Ongai Tahu in New Zealand, insisted that such research proceed only with indigenous consent. Science and tradition had finally set sail together. Today, the Polynesian Voyaging Society continues to navigate the world, spreading what they call Malama Honua, to care for our island Earth. Each voyage of Hokulea isn't nostalgia, it's proof that exploration is a living art, one that began with farmers in Taiwan and now circles the globe in unity and respect. The story of the Polynesians is not a myth of drifting canoes. It is evidence that human curiosity can cross any horizon. They carried their world in their boats, seeds, animals, songs, and memory. And in doing so, they built a civilization of motion across 16 million square kilometers of ocean. Their legacy survives in the genes that trace that journey, in the chants that still name the stars, and in every child who learns that the sea is not a barrier, it is a bridge. If this voyage through time and tide moved you, hit like and subscribe to Stone and Bone, where archaeology meets DNA and every forgotten expedition finds its voice again. Because history isn't written only in books, sometimes it's written in the waves.